Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, I hope you had some coffee. Okay. So, I, I hope you had some coffee and you had the opportunity to talk a little bit about bioenergy and, uh, and to drink some biomass. And uh, now I have the great pleasure to announce the lecture from Professor Charles Kinoshit uh, from the University of Hawaii, one of our most senior experts in bioenergy. And uh, we are very proud to have him here uh, giving these lectures today with us. So Professor Charles, thank you very much for coming from so long, so far from Sao Paulo to come here. And you have the floor. Thank you, Suwani. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the University of Sao Paulo for inviting me uh, to, um, to be part of this uh, school, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Suwani Coelho and Dr. Uh, Jose Simons Moreira. Uh, I really appreciate all the hospitality they gave us. And uh, today I'm going to be making two presentations or giving two lectures. I'm going to give two lectures. Uh, the first one is, sorry, I didn't mean to show that. Uh, the first one is on, um, uh, well, I'll discuss very briefly right here, in fact, what the first one is all about. And it's pretty much the front end of um, bioenergy. Uh, I'll f first talk about something that you've already seen at nauseum, uh, the global energy consumption and bioenergy's consumption or contribution, which uh, Dr. Uh, Coelho showed earlier. Uh, then some potential benefits and drawbacks of bioenergy, again, which uh, Suwani talked about a little earlier. And then maybe depart a little bit, talk about some of the most important bioenergy factors that will help to hopefully advance um, bioenergy use uh, worldwide and, and uh, allow bioenergy to have a larger part of the energy mix. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, some of the energy crops that we've been looking at in Hawaii and elsewhere. Uh, and then bio base heat and power. If I have enough time during the first session, I'll talk about first, second, third, and fourth generation biofuels, uh, which we've had a lot of discussion about already. And then in the afternoon, uh, I'll talk about other matters, uh, primarily the conversion processes and so on for drop in biofuels. Um, you've already seen uh, this uh, in various iterations. I don't know if the numbers will be exactly the same as the earlier ones, but pretty much, you know, this will tell the same story that renewables right now uh, have a fairly modest contribution, although a growing one in the energy mix. Uh, right here, using 2016 uh, data from the World Bioenergy Association, renewables, which includes hydro, by the way, in this graph, uh, make up about 18% of the total energy mix. Uh, and uh, bioenergy is a significant contributor to that, in fact, the lion's share. Um, just showing you a couple of numbers, and, and they're not very clear here, but uh, you know, Brazil has a total uh, energy consumption of uh, a little more than 10% of what the United States consumes. So the United States is a you know, tremendous consumer of energy, although I didn't realize it um, right now. In fact, we've been um, passed by China. Um, but uh, that's the, the consumption side. Now, the contribution of renewables, however, in the United States is only 8%, whereas in Brazil, it's uh, 43%. So the United States is lower uh, in terms of its uh, renewable energy contribution than the, the average for the world, and uh, Brazil is much higher. So you know, it's something that um, I think Brazil should be very proud of. Um, in terms of um, uh, taking a look at where uh, we're going moving forward, um, you know, certainly according to the World Bioenergy Association, which um, probably is painting a somewhat optimistic view of where bioenergy is going in terms of the energy mix, 
you can see that it's uh, bioenergy is one of the few portions of the mix that is actually uh, predicted to go up uh, significantly. I'm sure that if you ask the Coal Association, they might have a different picture, but um, I, I believe based on some of the things I see right now, including improvements in technology, about changes in rules, regulations, and policies, and concern about um, climatic effects, uh, bioenergy probably, or renewables, is probably going to increase uh, moving forward. Uh, quite substantially. Okay, um, in terms of the U.S. energy consumption by source, and this is uh, 2010 data, um, renewable energy made up only 8%. Um, but what was interesting is that biomass, in fact, bioenergy made up the largest share of the United States um, uh, renewable energy contribution, 53%, uh, in fact. Uh, in, in this uh, data from the uh, Department of Energy, I believe. Um, so what kind of potential benefits do we have um, from, from bioenergy? Uh, Suwani already mentioned some of those. Um, diversification of the energy mix, uh, reducing our dependence on imported energy, and I'll talk about that in the Hawaii context quite um, at length support of agricultural and food processing industries, environmental benefits, and these are the ones that probably most people are familiar with, uh, reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, potential benefits to the ecosystem, although many would argue that in fact it's having exactly the opposite effect, and I'll probably talk about that more than the positive benefits. Uh, improved air quality, uh, especially if you're talking about seizing open field burning of sugarcane or something like that, that would have a significant impact. Um, biodegradable fuels, that is, fuels that are bio-based are more biodegradable, so they pose a smaller uh, threat to uh, some of the ecosystem. Uh, reduce landfills, uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then a very important one, socioeconomic benefits, uh, regional and rural economic development, and employment opportunities. Um, now, let me talk about some things in the Hawaii context, uh, you know, because we are a unique location. Um, I hope many of you have visited in the past. Um, we're the re most remote, we're the most remote populated landmass on Earth. There's no other place on Earth that you can find that is more remote from every place else. Um, you can see here, you know, all of our neighbors, um, uh, Los Angeles, the closest one that I can point to there, is 4,000 kilometers away. And then everything else is much farther away. And then, of course, Sao Paulo, uh, although it's not necessarily our neighbor, is 13,000 kilometers away. So we're, we're far away from everything. We uh, import almost everything we consume in the state. The two major things that we import are food, and more than 85% of our food is imported, and more than 85% of our energy resources that we consume in the state is also imported. So we're highly dependent on others for the very basic necessities uh, in life, food and energy. Um, uh, you know, Swani talked about this in depth. The, the one good thing about bioenergy is that it is carbon neutral. Uh, uh, I should go back to the last uh, slide. The reason that is so important, or at least relevant, is that we are highly vulnerable to any kind of disruptions that we have in our supplies um, of uh, food and fuel. And therefore, uh, having a uh, indigenous source, something like bioenergy or other renewable energy sources that we can rely on would help to uh, protect us against any kind of disruptions that we might have. Um, as as you know, everybody knows, uh, bioenergy is carbon neutral, at least uh, in theory. Of course, in practice, it's not so carbon neutral. It's more carbon neutral than many other forms of, of energy. But um, it, this is one of them that's uh, fairly good. Bio-based power is uh, almost carbon neutral. About 95% of um, all the carbon that's emitted is then taken up by the plants. And uh, I should say only about 5% of the energy that goes into uh, you know bioenergy production or power generation production uh, is from fossil fuels. Uh, the rest pretty much is the uh, closed loop that, that uh, Dr. Coelho talked about. Um, 
but not all biofuels or bioenergy sources are quite as, um, you know, they're not all created equal. For example, if you took a uh, look at some of these uh, jet fuel pathways, uh, bioenergy or biofuel jet fuel pathways, you'll notice that some of them are, in fact, um, not very uh, complete in terms of, of um, uh, closing the loop. Uh, alcohol to jet fuel, for example, um, the greenhouse gas emissions are um, about half as much as uh, you would have from conventional jet, jet fuel produced from petroleum sources. Uh, some of these other technologies, oil to jet fuel, gas to jet fuel, this would be syn gas to jet fuel, and then sugar to jet fuel are much more efficient and, um, and rely much less on fossil energy inputs to, um, uh, to produce those fuels. But they certainly are not, um, you know, uh, certainly not closing the loop completely by any stretch. Um, one thing about uh, biofuels or bioenergy that makes it somewhat unique when you take a look at renewable energy sources is that this is probably one of the few, and I think Eric will probably talk about this more uh, tomorrow, that uh, can actually sequester carbon you know, uh, much more than the other uh, alternative energy uh, technologies. Uh, we all uh, saw the, um, uh, the scenario in which uh, we close the loop on, on, on carbon dioxide, but in fact, some technologies, such as pyrolysis, for example, if we produce a significant amount of biochar and use that as a soil amendment, as much as 50% perhaps, uh, could be tied up in the soil, uh, almost becoming fossilized. Now, I don't know what the time frame is on that, but it's certainly a fairly long time frame that in which you would be tying up uh, carbon. Um, so that, that's one attraction in bioenergy that, that is not um, uh, really available to many of the other technologies. Um, I talked about uh, you know, reduced landfill. In Hawaii, it's, it's a major problem. Uh, we are running out of space to uh, create new landfills. People don't want landfills uh, to live, you know, nearby them and so on. So uh, quite recently, in fact, for the last 10 years, we've been looking at the possibility of actually taking the garbage that we produce and shipping it off somewhere else, you know, which is kind of tragic. Uh, we're creating a problem for California, perhaps, you know, that, that we, we generate, and that certainly isn't going to help any of our energy security or any other security. Um, you know, so we're looking at uh, transporting up to about 100,000 tons of, of garbage a year to, um, uh, to, the, to the West Coast, which is about 4,000 kilometers away. So you, know, you, can take, you can see the kind of additional carbon footprint we are looking at presenting here. It's not a solution. In fact, it's a bigger problem that we're creating by um, not being able to uh, deal with our own garbage. Um, I briefly talked about some of the socioeconomic benefits. Um, we've done studies on the number of jobs that could be created uh, using bioenergy uh, farms, et cetera. And right here, I show you uh, one of the species that we're looking at, banagrass, uh, which is an elephant grass um, or kind of a, uh, uh, a guinea grass, I guess, uh, pretty much. Um, here uh, we have a seven-month-old uh, um, crop of, of banner grass. It's a very uh, fast-yielding uh, energy cane type of, of system, um, and um, you know it has a productivity uh, efficiency or photosynthetic efficiency uh, considerably higher than sugar cane and lower water requirements than sugar cane. So this is an attractive uh, crop for us. Right here, uh, here I stand, I'm not very tall, but this is only a 2.3 month old ratoon crop. So you can see how quickly uh, this comes back. Um, the uh, plantation that we looked at uh, was a 12,000 acre banagrass plantation, and it created something on the order of um, about 185 jobs uh, to run this, both in the field side as well as in the um, processing plant. Um, uh, I show here all the, the you know, workforce requirements for a 6,000 hectare plantation. And basically, we would be creating about 650 jobs. In Hawaii, that's a significant number of jobs that uh, 
uh, that we'd be looking at. So there are uh, a lot of uh, socioeconomic benefits in, 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 you know, in doing this as opposed to uh, just importing fossil fuels from, from other countries. And these, by the way, many of them are extremely high uh, value jobs. I worked for the sugar industry for 10 years, so I, you know, I feel very fondly about the value of, of being part of that, uh, that industry. Um, now, there is an interesting uh, development that's happened in Hawaii. We have a strong commitment to uh, renewable energy. In fact, uh, very recently, our governor signed a bill that sets a goal of 100% renewable energy. In fact, it's not a goal, it's a law. The utility companies have to convert over to 100% renewable energy in, uh, by the year, um, it was 2045, somewhere, oh yeah, right here. 2045, 100% of the electricity sales by the utility companies have to come from renewable energy sources. Uh, we're the first state in the country, in fact, to adopt you know, such a uh, hefty goal. Now, of course, California not wanting to be outdone by anybody uh, in the United States immediately after we set that goal, set the same goal themselves. Uh, and they're quite a bit larger than we are, about 40 times, I think. So um, I think that makes me somewhat optimistic that, in fact, that upward trajectory that you saw earlier in the growth of uh, renewables is, is actually going to happen because we'll see more and more states uh, prompted by um, you know, concern over, in our case, uh, the, the uh, let me see, yeah, okay, 100% electricity sales, uh, first state in the nation to set that goal. And the governor pointed out that the reason we're doing this is to improve our economy, our environment, and our energy security. All of those things that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, but um, not everything is uh, perfect, uh, bioenergy, also has a number of uh, potential problems associated with it. Uh, it has a relatively low efficiency in converting solar energy into usable energy end products. Uh, you folks took a look at PV earlier uh, or heard about it. Many of you are, have signed up for that. Uh, you know, PV systems are, are quite efficient, uh, even though they have their limitations in converting uh, insulation into uh, commercial or, or usable energy. Uh, in biomass, uh, the, the conversion rate is a lot lower. Um, there's often a marginal energy output to input ratio, and, and uh, Dr. Coelho talked about that in depth, and uh, many of the questions uh, that were uh, posed this morning talk about that issue. Uh, a major one right now is a concern over food versus fuel, and, and Swanee touched upon that as well. And obviously there's a potential negative impact on biodiversity and the ecosystem uh, that we can't ignore. But much of it depends, as, as Dr. Coelho mentioned, in the type, uh, in, in your management system, how you manage your uh, cropping systems. Yeah? Okay, uh, the first one, low conversion efficiency. Um, you know, I guess uh, there's a saying universally that the only things in life that are certain are death and taxes, and it turns out that in bioenergy systems or in plants, in fact, it's the same thing. You, they have to face death and taxes. Um, taking a look at the solar energy that comes in, in so <coughs> solar energy that's uh, incident on at ground level, okay? Forget about all the stuff that's reflected or these days more absorbed. Um, um, out of that 100% of the solar uh, radiation that's incident on Earth, uh, immediately, about um, half of it is uh, taxed because it's really outside of the photosynthetic active region for biomass. Yeah. It's outside of this uh, sweet spot, 400 to 700 nanometers, which is the only part that, that, that plants can actually photosynthesize. So we lose half of it right there. Uh, we also have incomplete com uh, absorption. Uh, we have some wavelength uh, mismatch that all contribute to losses or taxes that are taken off the top before the plant can actually use it. Um, then there's inefficient conversion of ATP and NADP. These are cofactors that convert the uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide or carbon into uh, glucose molecules. Um, coming further down, 
as uh, it gets into the plant, we have other losses that occur, and uh, it really depends on whether these are C4 plants or C3 plants. Uh, the distinction is that the C3 plants uh, go through some type of uh, three carbon uh, pathway before uh, the carbon uh, is uh, photosynthesized into, uh, into uh, glucose, and the C4 path uses a, a, a four carbon pathway before it, it goes into the plant. Uh, so once um, the, uh, you know, it, it is photosynthesized and, and the glucose is created, uh, we still have losses. Um, uh, one very important one, or significant one, that mainly is a problem with C3 plants is that C4 plants uh, have, uh, because of their metabolism, have found ways to in fact shut down their photorespiration rate so they don't lose energy in the process at night, et cetera, whereas C3 plants continue to do that, uh, which means that eventually, as you get all the way down, uh, the C3 plants are not as highly efficient photosynthetically as the C4 plants might be. So cascading downwards, uh, going through the tax system, beginning with 100 units of uh, uh, insulation that reaches the earth, uh, the ground level, um, only 4.6% uh, could be theoretically used um, or, or uh, converted into plant material, uh, energy, um, in C3 plants and only 6% in C4 plants. Now, these numbers are, are highly deceptive because they grossly overestimate how much, in fact, the plants are absorbing um, and using. Um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, if I use these two numbers, the 4.6% and the 6%, they would translate to theoretical yields of about 130 tons per hectare a year in biomass uh, energy um, for C3 plants and um, 180 tons per hectare a year for C4 plants, okay? at least theoretically speaking. Uh, you'll see later that you know, the actual performance is much, much less than that. By the way, uh, C3 plants are those that uh, make up about 95% of all the plants uh, in the world. Uh, there are trees, for example, large leaf plants. Uh, the C4 plants are typically grasses such as sugarcane, etc., which are highly um, efficient. Okay, now the problem with um, these low yields Okay, is that, of course, if you're going to have some type of conversion facility, you're going to have to draw in all your biomass from different locations, and the lower your yield is, the farther out you're going to have to go to get your, to harvest your biomass and transport it. And it turns out that trans transportation of your feedstock is a fairly significant cost component uh, when you take a look at the total cost of delivering and processing biomass, I think probably around 15% or so, and could be much greater than that if you have to go much further out. Uh, for example, if you had a perfect uh, you know, plantation that were completely circular and your uh, conversion facility was right in the middle, oh, um, you'd be looking at a uh, transportation cost that's uh, proportional to the transportation distance, which would be inversely proportional to the square root of the yield, okay? Now, that's if you had a perfect um, plantation. Uh, a few years ago, I took a look at two biomass plantations in the state of Hawaii, and um, the first one, uh, which is on, on the island of Oahu, uh, had a fairly nice configuration. Uh, you can see here, while not circular, it's, it's fairly, you know, uh, it looks uh, fairly efficient in terms of its uh, shape. Uh, if you had a conversion facility, for example, right here, you can see that probably, you know, if you kind of close your eyes a little bit, that uh, perhaps the cost would be inversely proportional to the square root of, of the distance. Um, the other one that I looked at, which was a much larger plantation, both of these were owned by the same company, um, you know, is, is um, not as uh, conveniently configured. Uh, this is on the big island along the Hamakua coast, and it stretches for around maybe 50 kilometers across. 
And um, unfortunately, in the, while it was in sugarcane, the sugarcane factory was right here. So you can see that in that case, uh, the, the cost is not going to be um, proportional, inversely proportional to the square root. It's probably going to be inversely proportional to the actual um, yield, okay? So if you're here and your, your costs are, um, uh, well, let me go back to the last one. Where, um, for example, in this particular case, if you had a circular plantation uh, and your yield were uh, 50, do I mean your 50 tons per acre uh, or hectare year, your, your cost might only be about $2.30. If your yield were instead much more typical of many um, you know, non-tropical species at 10 tons per hectare a year, your cost would be uh, you know, $5 per ton, significantly more. If you're in a plantation that's not so well configured, you can imagine that instead it would be $10 per, per ton uh, harvested. So you know, that, that's it. that is a problem with biomass because the yield is, is uh, relatively low. Um, the other thing that's always been a concern uh, with, with bioenergy is the energy output to input ratio. Uh, for biofuels, it hasn't been impressive in many cases. Uh, Dr. Coelho talked about, uh, for example, corn ethanol. And here you can see, in fact, you know, maybe 30 years, 40 years ago, um, it turns out that corn ethanol had a negative uh, you know, energy input to output. In fact, it was running into deficit. It probably took 1.2 gallons of uh, fossil fuels to produce one ethanol equivalent, uh, one gallon uh, ethanol equivalent of, or gasoline equivalent of ethanol. Uh, that has improved. Uh, the blue is the energy input. The red is the energy output, the ethanol uh, energy output from corn. And you can see that at least the, the relative uh, differences in those two, um, it's getting bigger. Um, and right now, you're looking at probably one and a half or so. Uh, and if you add some of the byproduct credits, you can see that uh, it's, it's over two, but, but not, not that impressive overall. Um, by contrast, and, and here are some of them, I think uh, Swani even has this uh, graph in her presentation tomorrow with corn, sugar beets, and wheat. Um, the energy uh, balance is, is not so great. Um, Corn 1.4, uh, you know, wheat 2.0, but sugarcane is really uh, one of the most efficient crops in terms of having a good energy output to input ratio, and part of it is because um, you know the energy inputs are, are fairly reasonable, and the uh, and the productivity of the crop is is so extremely high. Um, so, um, in fact, I think this data came from uh, this university. Um, you know, moving on, the food versus fuel challenge is, is a significant concern. If you take a look at the arable land use per person, uh, you know, universally, whether you're talking about North America, Europe, Central America, uh, Central Asia, etc., you know, um, South Asia, uh, the world right here, um, the uh, amount of uh, arable land that we have available to us per person is continuing to drop, uh, partly because we're losing some of that land, but mostly because our population keeps increasing. So, you know, we're going to have a hard time just feeding people in the future. And now if we're going to have to then uh, set aside a lot of that acreage for energy crop plantations, we're going to have a much bigger challenge in, in trying to feed and fuel our population. Um, now, one promising thing, uh, at least note, is that uh, if we go to second generation fuels, okay, which don't rely on food crops, uh, they tend to be a lot more stable in terms of their pricing uh, than uh, some of the food crops, uh, which are highly volatile. For example, looking at the last uh, 10 years or so, you can see that um, in the case of palm oil and uh, sugar, uh, the prices have been highly volatile, and some have argued that some of the, pipe, uh, the, the price spikes that we've seen in the past have been due to you know, conversion of some of these uh, 
uh, food crops into energy uses. Uh, by contrast, if you take a look at um, hard logs, um, during that same period, uh, the price has been relatively stable. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessarily because this is not a food crop, but more than likely that was a factor in terms of at least tempering the volatility of, of uh, the prices over the years. Um, in terms of biodiversity or diversity in general, uh, that's very important in Hawaii. Uh, we are, I think, one of the most diverse locations on Earth. We're very small, but in fact, our, you know, within our small state, we have 11 of 12 soil orders, so we're almost the entire world uh, in terms of our soil. And we're 10 out of 14 climactic zones. Uh, we're one of the few places where, in fact, you can snow ski and then go snorkeling, probably uh, with a two-hour drive. You know? um, so um, uh, we're highly diverse, and that is very important to us. However, we have been uh, very unfortunate in terms of our diversity or our, um, our endangered species, for example. This is something that came out of the Huffington Post. Um, wow, it was updated only uh, less than one year ago. And uh, the title was Hawaii is the Endangered Species Capital of the World. Um, it says here, Hawaii makes up less than 0.2% of the U.S. land, but over 25% of the species found in the nation's endangered species list are in fact part of Hawaii. So, you know, we have a disproportionately large number of species that are going, that are being threatened for extinction. Um, so we are concerned about that. Um, we feel that there is some bit of optimism on the other hand, uh, taking a look at, um, uh, at uh, Brazil, for example, we see here that, um, you know, their sugar industry uh, makes up only about 2.8% of the total uh, arable land um, area. And there's still a significant amount, about 30% that is available for expansion uh, if you went into biofuels uh, for the sugar industry. In fact, much more than sugar industry holds right now. Uh, what is uh, somewhat more, I think, optimistic is that, or at least gives me reason for optimism, is if you take a look at the uh, conversion efficiency of ethanol per hectare in Brazil, it has increased quite substantially. Right now, it's at, um, it, whereas it used to be about 4,000, now it's uh, over 8,000 liters per hectare year. So with continuous improvements in efficiency, hopefully the size or the footprint of the uh, sugar industry doesn't have to you know, increase. Um, they can absorb much of that with uh, increased uh, efficiency and new technologies. Okay, and then uh, finally, uh, impact on biodiversity and the ecosystem. Um, energy crops, particularly C4 species, have high water requirements. Uh, for example, and I think Swanee talked about um, sugarcane water use. Uh, I gotta applaud Brazil for its efficiency in terms of using uh, water. In Hawaii, when we had a sugar industry, which by the way closed down last year, our last mill went out of production, when I started working in the sugar industry, we had uh, about uh, close to 200,000 acres, and, and last year, we're down to zero. Um, and part of it is because uh, of the way I think we used to grow sugar cane. Uh, Suwani mentioned that uh, most of the sugar cane here, at least in the Sao Paulo area, is rain-fed. In Hawaii, uh, that wasn't the case. Most of our plantations that, in fact, survived were irrigated plantations. Um, and it turns out that sugarcane, not surprisingly, being a C4 plant, uh, is a very thirsty plant. It consumes about 1,000 kilograms of water for one kilogram of dry matter. So, you know, so if, if you're irrigating your fields, you're gonna have to pay for all that water. Uh, just as an example, the two plantations I showed you earlier, we did an analysis for the, the, the company that owns that land and they wanted to go into ethanol production. Uh, and, and we noted that in one case on the Hamakua coast, um, the amount of rainfall was very high. I mean, I think on that plantation, they have about 80 inches a year. I can't make the conversion here, but, um, and so the amount of applied water 
irrigation water was very low. By contrast, the other location on Oahu uh, needed about half of its water to be applied through irrigation. And uh, basically, from an economic standpoint, what it meant was, depending on how much the water cost, and we do have to pay for that water, by the way, uh, to use that water, uh, if we went to the worst case scenario, one dollar per um, uh, thousand gallons of, of water that, that we use, uh, in the case of this Kawailua plantation, the cost of just the water alone to irrigate the sugar, uh, sugar cane or energy cane would have been 61% of the value of the ethanol that we produce. I mean, just for the water, okay? Uh, now, for the uh, Hamakua location, where in fact most of the water is rain fed, uh, the impact is much smaller. Even at the highest cost for water, uh, it would just represent 26%, but that's still a significant uh, cost factor. Um, so, uh, we've taken a look uh, in Hawaii at a whole host of different types of uh, energy feedstocks. Uh, in fact, much of my life was uh, spent in, in, in looking at these and trying to evaluate them for their efficacy, how efficient how you know, they were in, in, in terms of producing biomass, some of the crops that we looked at. Uh, eucalyptus, of course, is, is very big in, in Brazil. Um, uh, some of the tropical hardwoods are you know, Lucena, um, Cassiolina, et cetera. We took a look at, at all of those, and those were all tropical hardwoods. Um, Banagrass, uh, the one I showed you earlier, uh, the scenario that we looked at for one of the plantations, uh, that, that very tall grass with very high yields. Um, we, we tried that on, on Oahu, grew about 1,000 acres of that. Um, Energy cane, we grew that on Maui, tried that for a while, uh, with very, very high yields, by the way. Um, and then, uh, most recently, we have worked with a private company in looking at uh, pangamia. I don't know if um, Brazil grows any pangamia. It's a nut um, crop, oil nut crop, and the yields of uh, pangamia are extremely high, uh, not quite as high as perhaps palm oil, but um, probably higher than uh, almost any other, Jotropha. You know, I think it's higher than Jotropha. Uh, so that looks very promising, and because there's the possibility of producing a, an animal feed byproduct, we're, we're quite excited about that. And then, of course, microalgae. We have, or at least at one time, we had one of the largest microalgae farms in the world. No longer, of course, um, because there are some very big ones uh, coming up now. And, uh, and, and we looked at all of these different crops for their productivities, et cetera, their yields. And um, so moving along, uh, you know, what are the important points or factors in bioenergy? Well, uh, you know, we have uh, important factors that deal with uh, the, the feedstock, uh, important factors that deal with the conversion and then important factors that are relevant to the uh, final end product. Uh, as far as um, the uh, biomass uh, feedstock goes, of course, biomass yield properties and the feedstock costs are, are very important. Probably feedstock costs is the most important. Um, intermediate or, or in, the, in between, uh, in terms of the conversion, the conversion yield, of course, is if important, the conversion efficiency. But again, the conversion cost is you know, what really determines whether something is going to be viable. Uh, and then finally, on the back end, the value of the energy product and any kind of byproducts that we can get out of this uh, is, is important. Our feeling is that uh, unless we can produce a byproduct, um, none of these are, are, are going to be viable, at least not in the short term. And then underlying all of that, of course, are the environmental, social, and other factors which we need to consider. Um, let's talk about feedstock costs only for a second. Um, you know, it turns out that biomass really isn't that expensive a feedstock when you compare that against the incumbent. Uh, fuel oil uh, at $70 a barrel, and that's the number I found uh, about 10 days ago for the cost of uh, fuel oil, translates to $11.70 per gigajoule. If I had to harvest trees or grass or something like that and deliver it to a plant at $100 a dry ton. $100 a dry ton, which is, by the way, 
quite a bit higher than most um, studies assume it'll cost. My assumption, it won't cost that much. Okay? But that still translates to only half the cost of fuel oil in terms of your feed stock cost. Okay? So uh, inherently, I think biomass has kind of an advantage over fuel oil in terms of being a fairly cheap feedstock to use. Now, there are many other issues, of course, that might turn the tables, and uh, the conversion costs are extremely high, and, uh, and there might be some you know, gross inefficiencies in the conversion as well. Okay? Um, th some of the important properties in, in biomass, I, I talked about them. The first one is moisture content. If you took a look at just con uh, you know, combustion, uh, for example, in the use of a boiler, you can see here that most, uh, you know, maybe trees and biomass feedstocks are uh, somewhere between 50 and 70 percent uh, moisture content. And um, already you can see a significant decrease in the theoretical efficiency that you would have in terms of that. So it does impact your energy conversion quite significantly. Uh, even worse in terms of gasification, if you took a look at the raw feedstock again at 50 percent to 70 percent moisture content, uh, what you'll see is that the parasitic energy that goes into this, the amount of heat that has to go into just uh, gasifying the biomass would represent somewhere between 30 percent and 65 uh, percent of the energy in the gas that you produce. So, you know, moisture content is always an enemy of efficiency. We have to get rid of that. But there are ways, of course, mechanically dewatering it or drying it that, that might help to um, abate some of that. Secondly, the proximate and ultimate analysis, that is the amount of carbon, volatiles, ash uh, that you have, which is approximate analysis. The ultimate analysis, which would be the chemical constituents, the main ones being carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, and the higher heating value are all important things when you're trying to consider uh, the, the value or what is a good biomass feedstock. Um, uh, right here I show in red uh, typical values of uh, the proximate and ultimate analysis for uh, biomass uh, feedstocks and I compare those against, um, against uh, for example, solid fuels and against uh, liquid fuels and you'll see that there are dramatic differences. Uh, you know, the energy content is much lower in biomass. Um, the oxygen content is very high. And all of those uh, present some real problems in terms of converting that efficiently into some of the things, the end products that we want to produce. Um, so, uh, let's see. Okay, recalcitrant properties, uh, that is things that are just going to be a, a real pain to work with when you're trying to convert this either thermochemically or biologically into a fuel. Um, some of the things that are very bad in biomass, uh, in fact in banagrass, the thing that I showed you earlier, if you harvested banagrass, you'll find that the uh, amount of potassium oxide in it is uh, extremely high. Uh, 45.9 um, compared to 13.4 um, percent of ash on a mass basis is uh, potassium oxide. The problem with potassium oxide as well as chlorine and so on, which is also high in, in, in some of these biomass feedstocks, is that if you sent it through a thermal conversion process, what often happens, say a combustion process or a gasification process, the potassium will volatilize and then as it goes towards the back end of your conversion system, it'll recondense because you're always trying to take the temperature out of that. And once it recondenses, it presents a real problem. You know, as, as long as it's gasified, it's not a problem. It'll flow very nicely. But if it recondenses, and then it'll start trapping all of the particulates, etc., and then you'll have fouling problems in, in, your, um, in, in your product. So we've been spending quite a bit of time uh, looking at ways of uh, trying to get rid of all of these con uh, you know, recalcitrant materials. Uh, much of the work that we did um, at the University of Hawaii 
has dealt with uh, gasification of uh, biomass, uh, different types of biomass, including bagasse and banagrass. And, and the things that uh, most of it, or much of it, was on trying to get rid of all of these problem constituents. Uh, for example, on bench scale gasification, uh, we've taken a look at reducing tars, uh, that is all the oils, um, uh, compounds that are in, 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 in the product gas, as well as the alkaline materials that I talked about, potassium oxide and so on, which are problematic. Uh, also tracking nitrogenous species. Many of the, um, uh, the species that we have uh, are nitrogen fixing and we want to use them as feedstocks. The problem with that is uh, if you're going to use it in a combustion process, for example, now you've got fuel bound nitrogen that could produce NOx and, and create a real environmental problem, a pollution problem. Uh, you know, uh, Suwani alluded to a gasifier project that I actually I was hired at the University of Hawaii to go after, which we did succeed in getting um, as a state, um, and it was a scale-up facility uh, designed to handle about 100 tons per day, and uh, we sited it at a sugar plantation. Uh, much of the work that we did there was uh, targeted at, at doing hot gas cleanup, trying to clean up the material at a hot stage before things recondense, you know, grabbing the particles before they become a problem on the back end. I'll talk about that a little bit. So that's on the thermochemical conversion side. On the biological side, biological conversion side, uh, some of the important properties are uh, on biochemical side are the lignocellulosic structure, and I'll talk about that in a second, as well as the compo um, chemical composition, which come to think of it, I won't talk about at all. Um, if you take a look at uh, plant cell walls, um, what you'll see is that the plant, the plant is, consists of uh, three different types of uh, uh, you know, cellulosic ma well, uh, material. Um, cellulose is, is a fairly significant um, component. It makes up about maybe 35 to 40 percent of, of plant biomass, depending on what kind of species you're talking about. Hemicellulose uh, uh, makes up probably about another 30%, and then uh, lignin makes up uh, usually about 30%. Uh, cellulose is a long chain of glucose molecules, yeah, just chained along. Uh, hemicellulose is a long chain of pentose uh, molecules, or five carbon sugars, hexoses, and then Lignin is just kind of a mess of stuff, and it's the thing that gives plant its structure, so it has the ability to at least stand up, etc. cetera, you know? um, Now, um, you know, if, if we try to uh, convert this into ethanol today, and, and they're doing that right in, um, in Brazil right now, I believe is what uh, Suwani alluded to, you can uh, you know, hydrolyze biomass break out the cellulose portion, convert that into glucose, and using yeast that uh, make alcohol in beer, or anything else for that matter, in ethanol, you can use conventional yeast to convert that glucose into, uh, into ethanol. Okay. The hemicellulose is a little more problematic. Um, you know, uh, in the past, uh, what happened was uh, most of the yeast that we had, the conventional commercial yeast, weren't good at converting uh, the xylose portion, the five-sided sugar portion, into ethanol. So uh, we had to find ways to find new organisms or genetically engineer new organisms that would take the five-sided sugar and uh, produce ethanol out of it. And uh, I'll show you in a second what, uh, you know, pretty neat stuff went on to actually genetically engineer bacteria instead of yeast to then do what yeast do to other sugars, that is, produce ethanol. The uh, lignin portion is something that it, it, it's, it's kind of a hot mess. We don't want to work with it. But it turns out that uh, every type of conversion process you have in the universe almost requires a certain amount of process heat. So we can always use the lignin, which would be the residual material that's left behind. Uh, in order to produce the, the process heat that we need. Um, the, um, let, me, let me just show you some yields of selected energy crops that um, most of these are, are data from Hawaii. Uh, Napier grass uh, and banner grass and so on. 
the fiber yield is about 47 uh, tons per hectare a year. At least that's what we're, we're, we're projecting on a commercial basis. Uh, sorghum, 22, miscanthus, uh, 22, and then it goes down. Uh, switchgrass, uh, we don't grow any in Hawaii, but on the mainland, uh, this is a temperate crop, uh, you know, it, and that's probably the one that most of the U.S. is looking at its energy crop. Uh, it has a fairly low yield of about 16 tons per hectare a year. Uh, eucalyptus is, is somewhat better, but not much, 18. You know, a C3 plant, and then pine is only nine. Uh, sugar cane sugar, okay, just the sugar portion, uh, has a yield of about nine tons per hectare a year. Beets about the same. Sorghum a little lower, and then corn starch is uh, you know about six tons per hectare a year. Um, if you take a look at the oil crops, um, they're they're even lower yet. Okay, plants apparently don't produce oil all that well. Uh, oil palm, about five tons per hectare a year. The trofa, 1.6. Rapeseed, 0.4. Soybean, 0.4. I think uh, the pangamia that we we're looking at, uh, we would project be probably around two and a half. So we're very excited about that. But, but you can see that that's much lower than the kind of yields you would get from fiber or sugar crops. I want to point out, as I did earlier, that the uh, theoretical yields that we would get out of C3 plants were about uh, 130 tons per hectare a year, and C4 plants, 180. So you can see that uh, there's a significant difference even between our most efficient plants, say napier grass or banner grass or something like that, at about 50, versus what it should theoretically be 180. Okay, so whereas uh, these were producing at a yield of about 3 to 5% total efficiency, you can see that what we're getting is about 1% or even lower. And when you compare that against, um, um, oh, uh, this is something uh, different, but, but when you compare that against photovoltaics, which is 10 to 20%, you know, uh, we, there's, there's a, a big gap between uh, you know, bioenergy and, and photovoltaics. Um, by the way, even though I pointed out that we're only producing about 30% of what we theoretically could produce, I do point out that um, some work done by uh, people here at the uh, University of Sao Paulo, for example, have indicated that in sugarcane, at least, anywhere from 13% to 23% of the dry matter is underground, which we never harvest. So those don't appear in, in, you know, in our numbers. Yeah? Okay, um, now I'm going to depart from this and, and finally talk about conversion systems and, and Swani uh, or Jose, and let me know when I'm running out of time. Um, and, and talk first about combined heat and power. Um, and this refers to cogeneration or concurrent generation of electricity or mechanical power and thermal energy, uh, heating or cooling, from a single source of energy. And I got to say that probably uh, the oldest industry, maybe in the world, that took advantage of cogeneration was the sugar industry. Um, and uh, it does so, at least in today's terms, uh, something like this. You've got your gas fuel, uh, or your, your sugar cane comes in. It's milled uh, to extract sugar. The residual fiber that's left behind is the gas. It's burnt in a boiler to produce steam at fairly high pressures. That steam then uh, at high pressure goes into a turbo generator uh, and uh, is extracted at several different pressures. Uh, these different pressures are designed for different uses. Uh, a high pressure stream comes out and it is used to run many of the mechanical pieces of equipment, the mills being the major uh, parasitic requirement for energy or power in the factory. Um, but uh, there are other units, uh, pumps, um, fans, and so on, to run the boiler system and so on, are all used uh, use at high pressure steam. A uh, lower pressure steam, about one bar, uh, uh, about, yeah, about one bar or uh, gauge, uh, is used to, um, to process sugar. 
okay, to evaporate the water that's in the sugarcane juice. And it turns out that that's a very significant uh, requirement uh, in the sugar factory, and I'll show you something on that in a, in a second. And then finally, a small portion, about usually 30% or so, uh, is, uh, goes all the way to the end to very low pressures, uh, typically uh, two inches of mercury, so that's about one PSIA uh, for those who are engineers. Um, very low pressure, vacuum pressure, and that goes into a condenser, and pretty much all of that then uh, closes the loop and it goes round and round and round. Uh, this whole system is, is really quite ingenious and has been used uh, for a long time. In fact, uh, I believe Hawaii was the first place to use uh, electric power generation uh, from sugarcane. I remember looking in some of the archives when I worked for the sugar industry, and only about 20 years after, in fact, electricity became commercial, was first used ever uh, commercially by um, a utility power plant, uh, the Hawaiian sugar industry installed a fairly significant size uh, turbo generators and boilers and so on. In fact, uh, at one point, I, I recall seeing that Hawaii had the uh, you know, highest pressure boilers and, and turbo generators in, in the world. Um, so um, I, I, I have some kind of question for some of you, uh, those of you who are engineers or non-engineers. Um, you know, I showed you what we have here. We harvest sugar cane. Earlier I talked about that. Then we uh, express the juice out. And then to help in the expression, that is in the extraction process of getting that sugar out of the fiber, we actually add more water so we can help the extraction of that um, sugar out. We want to try to recover as much sugar as we can. Um, and that sugar cane juice goes into the, you know, the back end of the factory and then has to be boiled you know, in order to produce sugar at the end. So we have to get rid of a lot of water. In fact, the amount of water that we have to get rid of is about one ton of water for every ton of sugar cane that comes in. And you've got to remember that the sugar cane comes in at about 70% water. So you know, there's a lot of water there inherently. And then we add more water on top of it. Um, it turns out that one ton of sugar cane has 0.14 tons of bagasse fiber, which has a potential energy yield once you try to convert that into steam and usable energy of about uh, 1,740 megajoules, okay? This is a problem for the class. Now, that 1,740 megajoules of processed heat has to evaporate one ton of water. That one ton of water is liquid, and in order to get into a vapor phase, needs, at the very least, 2260 megajoules is the latent heat of vaporization. That is, you have to put in that much energy to evaporate the water, okay? In addition to that, I have to run mill equipment, you know, this and other pieces of equipment. That's not even generating a kilowatt hour of exportable electricity, okay? By the way, in Hawaii, we used to generate about, I think, 100 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per ton. So we generated a lot of electricity out of, uh, out of sugar cane. Uh, and we were by far the most efficient in the world. Um, but that's uh, just, just the, you know, the uh, power needed to run the mills and so on translated to 54 megajoules. So you can see that when you add these two up, they're much greater than the amount of energy that we have in the fiber. Yeah, okay. Now the question I have to you is, how the heck did we do that? You know, and, and, and we've done that for a long time. Um, anybody have any ideas? Okay, I'll show you. Um, the, the way we did that is we would use what we call multiple effect evaporators and uh, that was invented uh, quite a long time ago, okay? Uh, and I'll show you how it works. But anyway, the inventor, uh, well, let me talk about this. The operating pressure and corresponding, by the way, I'm taking this out of my class in, in uh, unit operations, so I don't know if it's written too well. Uh, operating pressure and corresponding saturation temperature drops in each successive vessel, allowing the va vapor from one vessel, okay, uh, to, uh, heat the solution in the next vessel, thereby increasing the amount of liquid evaporated per unit of external heating medium 
for example, scheme. I, I know it's a you know, mouthful, but basically what we do is we take uh, whatever is evaporated from the first evaporator, put it into the second evaporator, drop the pressure, and if all of you remember your thermodynamics, you would know that as you drop the pressure, the saturation temperature comes down, so the solution will boil at a lower temperature. So what you can do is you take the vapor from the first one, you put it into the second one, the second one has a lower pressure, which has a lower temperature, saturation temperature, so all of it starts evaporating again. So you just keep tricking the thing along the way. And this ingenious thing was developed uh, in 1843 by a person, uh, uh, a, you know, an African-American uh, engineer who was working in Louisiana, Norbert uh, Rillot. Uh, he was the one who invented the multiple effect evaporator and it was first used, in fact, in the sugar industry, not surprisingly. Now, of course, it's used in almost every industry that has uh, evaporation requirements. Um, so uh, just, just to show you what I have in my class, uh, in fact, even the, the homework problems that I gave them. Um, again, what you do is you take steam, you evaporate the first uh, vessel, and you produce vapor, then you use that to heat the second vessel, and you get new vapor, then you use it to hit the third vessel. So in a sense, what you can do is one unit of steam could, in theory at least, evaporate five units of, of water if you use a quintuple or five effect evaporator. This is really ingenious and helped us, in fact, become highly energy uh, self-sufficient. Okay, um, last thing I'm gonna talk about, at least in, in this section, is uh, how do we get better if we were in the, the sugar industry just using that as a prototypical system that uses combined heat and power? Well, um, you know, we could go from the old system that I showed you, which was basically having a boiler and a power a turbo generator <coughs> and then uh, extracting steam at various locations, using that to run systems and then uh, and then uh, generating electricity, both for internal use and external use, um, and then sending a portion of the steam over to the uh, processing end to evaporate the water. Uh, we could go into a, com a gasifier combined cycle system, which was what we wanted to do uh, when we worked on our sugar um, a gasifier project on Maui. And conceptually, it looks like this. Uh, you, you have your gas again coming in, you dry it, and then you put it into a gasifier, which then produces some type of product gas. It's at fairly high temperatures, and it's laden with um, all types of particulates. We would then send it into uh, some type of cyclone on the front end to get uh, remove the, the heavy particles, then into a tar cracker to try to break up any of the tars and oils so they uh, we no longer have condensables, um, go into then a hot gas filter and try to trap out all of the particulates before we send them downstream. Uh, once we get out of the hot gas uh, filter, we would then put it into an alkali getter that would get rid of the potassium oxide and other things like that, uh, and then cool it down a little bit before we put it into the combustor for a gas turbine system. So. It would go into the combustor and uh, generate electricity. Now, of course, we could uh, take a portion of that and send it into a fuel cell if we wanted to. We would have, you know, <coughs> uh, if we have uh, the right concentration of hydrogen. Uh, and, uh, and then once uh, we have the hot gases coming out of the back end of the gas turbine, put it into a heat recovery steam generator, and uh, that would then produce electricity in a steam turbine, and again, as in the classical uh, sugar plantation, we would take an intermediate uh, pressure steam, use it to run our mills, take the low pressure steam, use it to run our juice processing, evaporate our juice, for example. I sh okay, and then finally, uh, this would go come out the condensing side to generate electricity. Running out of time? Okay, I've got one more slide. Um, uh, it has the uh, advantage of um, uh, increasing electricity generation efficiency by about 50% and reducing our cost by about 30%. Uh, and this is the, the project that we had uh, and a conceptual one. Okay, I'll quit right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
This is something that our sugarcane companies are after. Uh, do, do you have any commercial ones that are really working? And no. uh, yeah, that's. No. Uh, our project ended uh, with loss of funding and, and so on. So, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know, Eric. You know of any um, gasifier-based power generation system right now? I mean, there are, there, there have been gen uh, uh, demonstrations that have. Uh, operated successfully, but I don't know about sugar cane. Yeah, there aren't any commercial operations today. There have been a, 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 two or three successful yeah. demonstration demonstrations. scale, but yeah. they've, they're too expensive to keep running. Yeah. So. You know, and that's the problem, uh, as, as Swanee pointed out. Uh, some of these have the promise of being highly efficient, but um, you know, making that transition from this to that is uh, often very costly and and when you have a, you know, a, a, a first uh, failure or lack of complete success and everybody gets discouraged, no funding, and then, uh, so, so have I run out of time, by the way? No, no. Oh, oh <laughs> okay. Okay, then, then I'll back up a second uh, and go back here. Uh, yes, this is the uh, project that we had um, at, at uh, one of our sugar mills. and. Um, and this was a 20 megawatt uh, uh, BIGCC, I think, uh, Biomass Integrated Gasifier Combined Cycle okay. um, System. And pretty much, uh, I already showed you the schematic of what it looked like, but we would take the gas again uh, and then uh, send it to the gasifier, clean it up, use it in a gas turbine on the front end. Uh, the hot gases would go into a steam turbine on the back end. So we could have a combined cycle and we could increase the efficiency quite substantially uh, before we then uh, go back through the loop again. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, end today's uh, presentation by having some discussion on first, second, and third, and fourth generation biofuels. And I put this in the back end of this uh, presentation and on the front end of the next one because I didn't know whether I would have enough time. But um, we've heard a lot, a lot about first and second generation biofuels, and I'm very impressed by, in fact, the knowledge that you have on this. Um, but you know, let, let me go over those four anyway, even though many of you seem to know maybe more than I do about it. Um, on the first generation biofuels, uh, which we'll call conventional biofuels, uh, these were produced from food crops uh, grown on, you know, lands that normally would be used for food crops, uh, prime agricultural lands. Uh, and they consisted of largely, uh, and, and Swanee did a good job already in, in you know, giving you the, the information on this, vegetable oils, uh, canola, you know, palm oil, etc., and starch uh, or sugar, uh, this would be uh, uh, corn in the United States, uh, sugar cane in, in Brazil, that were converted into biodiesel or ethanol using, in the case of biodiesel, transesterification, or in the case of ethanol, yeast fermentation. And these first generation biofuels were uh, criticized for a number of reasons, and I talked about some of them earlier. Uh, number one, they had, at least they were viewed to have marginal environmental benefits. Now, I, I gotta say that, you know, Brazil's ethanol program is probably uh, an exception to, to that because of the high output to input ratio. I already talked about the problem with corn ethanol. Uh, it is making significant increases or improvements, but in fact still it's, it's not great. Um, <coughs> and especially it was criticized for placing food in competition with fuel because as I said, these were pro you know grown, produced from food crops, grown on lands that were intended to be used for food production. So, you know, when, when you start diverting some of that land over to uh, fuel production, it becomes uh, kind of a problem. Uh, so, um, these are the first two that um, uh, are, are the most widely known, and this would be uh, conversion of plant oil or even animal fat uh, through transesterification into biodiesel, and biodiesel is basically mixed with uh, gasoline, uh, I'm sorry, with, with uh, regular diesel. Uh, 
uh, fuel in, in the US. Yeah? It can't be used as a standalone fuel. Um, Sugarcane and corn uh, are uh, either starch or the sugars. The starch would be converted into sugars and then fermented using yeast into ethanol. And unlike in Brazil, in the United States, of course, that's always mixed with gasoline. We don't have any neat ethanol or you know regular ethanol uh, cars. Although that that's always surprised me because um, the conversion over to a flex two vehicle is is fairly simple. So. It shouldn't be hard, but uh, the U.S. has never chosen to do that, probably because we could never produce that much anyway. Um, the um, process for uh, converting ethanol uh, from sugar and biodiesel from oils and fats are shown here. In the case of um, uh, ethanol, we take glucose, sugar, convert that into pyruvate, and uh, these are then converted further before they are transformed into two molecules of ethanol and we release two molecules of carbon dioxide. Um, it, the process is fairly efficient um, and the end products are of course uh, ethanol which is a fuel and uh, carbon dioxide which is uh, a gas but at least it's at the lowest energy state. I mean, you understand that whenever you're using carbon and hydrogen, your ultimate goal is to try to get to the lowest state, which would be carbon dioxide and water vapor, uh, or liquid water. Uh, so so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's there. Uh, and you know, so the, uh, that's pretty efficient. In terms of biodiesel from oil fat, uh, oils or fats, I take uh, one part of uh, oil or fat, uh, and in, in, uh, in, in the presence of a catalyst, uh, add uh, three parts of uh, some alcohol, mostly methanol is used, and that is converted into uh, glycerol or glycerin, and then I get three units of uh, methyl esters or biodiesel out of that, fatty uh, acid methyl ester fame or biodiesel. Um, so the, the, you know, the conversions kind of look like that. Here's one molecule of uh, glucose producing two molecules of carbon dioxide waste uh, and uh, two um, uh, molecules of ethanol. Here, one molecule of oil, whatever that means. There's really no molecule of oil. Um, three molecules of alcohol producing one molecule of glycerin and three molecules of uh, something that looks like biodiesel. Uh, both of those are very efficient processes, but in fact, as I pointed out earlier, they, they do rely on uh, things that normally would be food crops and therefore uh, are highly criticized as uh, you know, not being ideal types of fuels. Um, so uh, we move on, and many of you have already shown me that you know what second generation biofuels look like. Uh, these are produced from lignocellulosic biomass, agricultural residues, or waste plant material. And hopefully, if they're grown as dedicated crops, okay, energy crops, they could be grown on lands that are not targeted for cultivating food, on more marginal lands than in our prime agricultural lands. Uh, and hopefully, unlike, uh, you know, the, the experience in Hawaii and sugarcane, they would not consume large amounts of water or fertilizer in their production. Uh, so the examples of uh, these feedstocks are energy crops, agricultural residues and green waste, MSW, black liquor, which is the residue left behind in pulping operations and so on. Uh, questions now? Oh, okay. Um, my name is Raquel, I'm here from Brazil. And about the first and also the second generation biofuels. Here in Brazil, because we have this land problem, we need either to increase the yields or have more land for grow the crops. So we are discussing a lot here like about using degraded grasslands or also having like confined leaf stock so you have more land for growing the crops. And I would like to know like in Hawaii or in the US, like how is how is that, like options, are people discussing what's the perspective of these options there? Okay. Well, uh, number one, we don't produce uh, any um, ethanol from, from 
from fiber, so unlike Brazil. Uh, so we don't have any experience with that. But in terms of collecting sh uh, residues, we have, uh, in some cases, sugarcane, for example, uh, in, in some cases gone to collecting uh, sugarcane trash, which would normally be burnt, and then would create uh, some, some you know, uh, emissions problems and so on, and brought that back to the factory and processed that for electricity generation. So we've been trying to do some of that. It's, it's largely a, um, a, a cost issue, yeah? And, um, uh, and also, it's largely an issue of dealing with regulations. In many cases, we did that because we were forced to do that. Uh, the neighbors who lived around sugar plantations, they didn't like open field burning, so that forced us to, in some cases, at least when the wind was blowing in the wrong direction, harvest the entire crop, bring it back, and then process the, the trash. Uh, in, in Hawaii, um, not so much you know, in using um, plant residues, but of course we have a, for a long time uh, taken much of the municipal solid waste that we have and converted that into electricity. Uh, in fact, on Oahu, the most populated island in the state, 70% of the uh, population in the state lives on Oahu. Um, all of the municipal solid waste that is generated from residential uh, places are treated and used in uh, generating electricity. So you know, we, we try, to, try to do that. In the future, I can see that becoming even more common. Did that answer your question? More or less? Maybe a little bit. Okay, um, and then examples of conversion processes, syngas uh, catalysis, uh, syngas to liquids using Fischer Trope, biocatalysis, hydrothermal upgrading um, <coughs> are the ones that um, are most common for drop in fuels. I don't show here, uh, you know, uh, sugarcane uh, fiber, for example, conversion, uh, because that doesn't produce a, a drop in biofuel. Um, you know, one th a digression for a second on that last one. Um, uh, we, you know, uh, Dr. Coelho talked about uh, the conversion of sugarcane bagasse into ethanol, the fiber into ethanol, and for a long time that's been a possibility using kind of the process I talked about earlier, which was to break up the sugarcane fiber into cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, taking the cellulose fraction, which is a long chain of glucose molecules, and breaking that up and using that uh, with just regular yeast to produce ethanol. Interestingly, about 20 or 30, about 20 years ago, um, what happened was Patent number five million, it just coincidentally, or maybe by design, US patent number five million was a patent issued to in fact go to a second generation process. That is to use the hemicellulose portion and convert that into ethanol as well. And you can see some of these, uh, the write up here uh, that came out of the uh, New York Times. Uh, and it was, uh, a, you know, it was a, a major um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think a major step in, in, in doing the second generation biofuels. In fact, this was, I think, the first significant step that we'd seen in terms of at least ethanol production. Uh, and, you know, this uh, professor, Dr. Ingram at the University of Florida, uh, created or designed a um, process using uh, genetically engineered E. coli. Uh, to convert the um, five-sided uh, sugars, the pentose fraction, into, uh, into ethanol, which I, I thought was a significant development. And many of the developments that have occurred since then were partly um, you know, copied off something that, that he did. The third generation biofuels uh, are, um, uh, they use specially engineered energy crops, uh, such as microalgae. In fact, I think almost all of it is microalgae uh, for um, biofuels. Now, the claim is, the claim is unlike uh, crop-based biofuels, uh, they don't compete with food production, and they don't require farmland nor fresh water. The reality is, in fact, um, depending on how you do it, 
it could require all of that and much, 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 much more. Um, I pointed out earlier that we had at one time, I think probably one of the largest uh, microalgae farms in, in, the, uh, in the world. Uh, and here's a, a photo of it, uh, Cyanotech on, on the Big Island. Um, most of what you see here uh, is uh, Hematococcus pluvialis. Uh, it's a microalgae strain. And uh, you can see here, in fact, this red and orange thing is uh, it's, it's the second stage of uh, the growth of, uh, in fact, it's not any longer growing. It's being stressed out so that it can uh, then produce um, astaxanthin, which is uh, the product that they're trying to produce. And it's not being used for bioenergy purposes, rather it's used for a high-valued um, nutraceutical yeah, nutraceutical process. Um, the fourth generation uh, biofuel would be one that uh, produces sustainable energy while it's se sequestering carbon dioxide. Uh, in fact, it'll be carbon negative instead of being carbon neutral. And I showed you, you know, one example of that earlier where we could produce biochar from uh, biomass using a pyrolysis process taking the uh, bio oil that comes out of that, using that for biofuel production, and then taking the char, putting that into the ground, and thereby sequestering carbon dioxide, at least for, uh, I don't know how long it'll last, a century or so, okay, as some type of CO2 uh, sequestering um, uh, strategy. Okay, with that, uh, I conclude uh, this morning's session. I don't know whether I finished early or late or pretty much on time. Uh, I want to thank uh, particularly you know, University of Sao Paulo, of course, but in particularly Dr. Swani Coelho and Dr. Jose Simoes uh, Moriera uh, and Vanessa uh, hiding back there, I think, uh, for their you know, warm uh, hospitality um, and for the great lunch yesterday. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, does anybody have any questions? And, and you know, you're going to have to speak loud, slowly. Uh, Hi. Do we, do we have a microphone? Oh, yeah, using the microphone. Uh, we don't have a traveling microphone anymore? Okay, we do have a, oh, okay. Can, Oh, okay, we're going to have that question first, and then we'll, we'll do this one. Hi. Remember, what, what were the two rules? <laughs> loud and slowly. <laughs> Hi, I am from um, Colombia. My name is Natalia Cano. I have two questions. Um, you chose LCA results uh, for different technologies. Uh, renewable and non renewable resources, and the, these results uh, have the same boundary systems, for example, cradle to gate, uh, gate to gate, I don't know. And the second question is uh, about the any application of uh, industrial application of furfural or hydroxymethyl furfural generated in this process. Okay, uh, the, the first question dealt with a cradle-to-grave analysis, yeah. Yeah. And, and Dr. Eric Larson is going to talk about exactly that tomorrow. So I'll, I'll leave I'll leave that question to him. Okay, so you can ask the same question tomorrow, or you know, Eric, if you want to answer it now, you can. <laughs> you want to? <coughs> um, so. If I understood the question, you were asking if the it, if the different cases were on the same basis, cradle to grave. Yeah. So that it was just oh. whether it was a consistent. I think the question was whether it was a consistent comparison from one case to the next. Um, which which cases are we talking about? I think it might have been your slide with Michael Wong's results for jet for jet fuel. Yeah. On which results? The jet fuel. <laughs> 
Oh, yes, yes. They were all on the same basis. I'm sorry. Um, so it, was so it, a it, question it has to be on the same basis to yeah. be a fair analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, the second question dealt with. Um, I'm sorry, she had one more second question. Uh, do you know the any application of uh, industrial application for furfural and hydroxymethyl furfural generate into the process uh, in the uh, pretreatment pretreatment process uh, by gasification, for example? Okay, uh, and if I understood the question, it dealt with hydrogen into oh other applications for 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 like gasification or something like. That? Oh yeah, I mean, in fact, that's part of the problem. Uh, there are much more attractive applications for almost everything we do than for energy uses, so we're forced to compete with uh, just about every use. You know, if, if you took a look at, for example, bioproducts, which uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on tomorrow, uh, this afternoon, um, those are much more lucrative than, than uh, bioenergy, so you know, we have to compete with those all the time. Uh, you mentioned, for example, furfural production, uh, or someone did, and um, you know, that's another end use. Thank God the uh, worldwide market for that is fairly modest, so not much of it has been converted, but, but <coughs> the value of the end product is much higher than, say, gasoline or anything like that that we could produce. Um, so we're, we're always competing with various end uses, and, but there are so many different things we can produce uh, using you know, all of these technologies. For example, when we looked at um, biomass gasification, the first thing that we were um, looking at was uh, producing, uh, in fact, uh, ammonia, not, not, not even uh, transportation fuels. Uh, hi, my name is Christina. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I was a bit surprised to, to find out that Hawaii um, exports the, the waste over such a long distance. And uh, I wanted to ask whether the government um, is planning to invest more in uh, recycling, waste incineration, because this is also a very important source of energy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the slide I showed was a was a plan. It never happened. Okay. okay. So, so we never shipped off 100,000 tons. Okay. Uh, I guess the threat of doing that and the expense of doing that changed our practices. And so today, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, all of our garbage has now been kind of shifted. We have complete sorting of all our garbage. So every week I have to sort my garbage out into uh, combustibles, which goes to our garbage to energy plant, into uh, green waste, which goes into um, composting, and then finally all our recyclables, which are recycled. So from a residential standpoint, almost none of it goes into the landfill and that has uh, reduced the amount of, uh, or the increase in landfill requirements for some time. Uh, having said that, we do have a problem. Right now, our landfill, our present one, is under an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, I forgot what you call it, but basically, we are not in compliance. The Environmental Protection Agency has told us, in fact, that we have to shut down our landfill, and we don't have any place to go. So. We do have uh, significant problems, you're right. I mean, the government needs to step in and do something, and, and they're trying. Yeah. I think we're back in compliance now in terms of our landfill. Thank you. Aloha, Professor. 
Uh, uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, my name is Dagon Ribeiro. I'm from Brasilia, the University of Brasilia. I, I work with microalgae. Oh. So the, the question is related to um, have some uh, integrated system about the like, different industries, like for first generation, the like, micro generation. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, integrate, uh, like, uh, make a lot of uh, like, uh, ethanol, uh, biofuel production, ethanol production, together with micro, uh, micro algae production, like using like CR2 and water, have some kind of example, like in how I like that? Yeah, thank you, if I understood your question correctly about the integration of microalgae with other uses. Uh, yes, um, uh, you know, uh, not, not so much the applications that you talked about, but of course, Wastewater treatment has always been one option that they've talked about. Uh, and uh, something that I'll, I'll show a little later as one of the projects I gave my class was um, not quite dual application in terms of different fuels, but taking uh, solar radiation, splitting it up. As, as I showed, you know, only the par fraction can go into, uh, can be photosynthesized. And that's only half of the energy, the other energy that's below a certain wavelength and above a certain wavelength uh, really can't go towards biomass production. So the idea here is you have solar energy coming in, you split it uh, using filters or other things into the par fraction and the NAR par fraction, using the par fraction for microalgae uh, production and then using the non-par fraction for other uses such as in photovoltaics and so on. So you produce algae and you produce electricity. Um, and, and there have been other uses, but you know, energy use is about the lowest valued use for almost anything. So as soon as we start looking at other applications of microalgae, what happens is that becomes the only use. My, my question is also regarding the algae, mm -hmm. because we know that we have like a very high cost with the cultivation and then we, it's like a wet biomass, it, it has to be dried. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know like your perspective, like according to your experience, do you think that we are going to have, uh, to ever have like a very established and with competitive price for liquid fuels or algae is going to go like for the chemical, okay. the chemical market? What's <laughs> your opinion? Um, and that's a very good question. And you know, a lot of people have talked about you know, the, the extremely high yields, high yield potential of algae, uh, pretty much reaching the, the, the photosynthetic efficiencies that I talked about, you know, 110 tons per hectare a year or something like that, you know, three times as much as we could get out of any land-based biomass. Uh, I've never seen that uh, you know, commercially. Uh, and uh, the Today, the biggest problem with uh, the um, oleochemical pathway, that is oil to jet fuel or, or biofuel pathway, is the high cost of the feedstock. And algae is probably the worst of all of them in terms of dollars per gram or kilogram of, of oil. It's very expensive. The yields might be great, but the cost of production is very high. Now, I don't want this to be public, but I'll say it anyway at one time. Uh, someone uh, asked um, an expert, someone who actually was doing research in microalgae, at what point will microalgae become competitive with, uh, you know, as, as a biofuel feedstock? He said, uh, when uh, oil costs are $1,000 a barrel. So, you know, that, uh, when, when you have people who are doing research in that area being somewhat optimistic, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a... I'm, I'm not real optimistic, but who knows? Uh, certainly, microalgae has the potential of having extremely high yields. Um, you know, many people have given a number of reasons. Uh, they don't have, you know, a root structure that they need to support and so on. But uh, producing microalgae is, is is not easy. It's probably a lot easier to talk about it than than do it. Hello, my name is Larissa. Thank you very much for your presentation. And regarding fourth generation biofuels, 
Do you think that this CO2 from uh, fermentation, in the case of uh, sugar cane, for example, uh, can be used for fuels or the CO2 from the combustion of the baguettes? Do you see this as a, as a future? Okay. Uh, the, the answer would be no. Uh, I, I don't see how, at least from the standpoint of CO2, extracting energy out of CO2. You can't extract energy out of CO2 because it's at the lowest, it's at the ground state in terms of the energy pyramid. Again, you know, CO2 and H2 are at the bottom state. Now, uh, our friend there who talked about microalgae, of course, you can always use CO2 as a feed for microalgae and there in the process of photosynthesis, it will use the CO2 so that would be one example. And of course, any of the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere is taken of a plant material, so it is used in a sense for generating uh, energy, but, but not, not, not in a real explicit manner. It's always kind of in an indirect manner. Yeah, yeah just mean like uh, power to gas or power to fuels that you use the CO2, and then together with hydrogen, you can produce methane or other Synthetic yeah. fuels. So okay. okay. In this kind of way that I, that I, I mean. I, I guess you could. I mean that, you know, much of what you're talking about is kind of reversing the direction of, of what we are trying to do right now. So, uh, yes, uh, all chemical reactions are reversible. So you, you know, whatever you did to get to CO2, can be reversed. But um, I don't see that commercially. Uh, making much sense, but who knows? No, I, I, I don't know that much about, about that. <coughs> oh, Mani has a question. Oh. Uh, if I may uh, try to participate in the oh. discussion, uh, just to make a comment on CO2 uh, uh, recycling. Uh, we have a few experiences now in Brazil uh, uh, the, the easiest one is, of course, to capture CO2 for fermentation and to use it in soft drinks industry. Uh, this is already being done uh, in several parts of Brazil. Uh, the second one is the use for other industries. Uh, we have uh, some experiences in Paraná State, a sugar ethanol mill. Uh, they are selling CO2 for uh, an industry to produce uh, sodium carbonate. Uh, and then, of course, you capture the CO2. And also, in the same region, they are selling CO2 for greenhouse mm -hmm. to grow plants ah. and to grow uh, wood, yeah. and then use also the, the CO2. Mm -hmm. So there are some, uh, a few experience that we are having now. Uh, so we could put together CO2 uh, capture, and then, uh, of course, Eric is going to talk about that tomorrow with much more competence, but just to to give a few experience that we have in Brazil. Thank you. Yeah, um, just, you know, it's a side story, but uh, much of the research I did before or during the time I was working on bioenergy had nothing to do with bioenergy. In fact, it was on CO2 sequestration. And there we looked at carbon dioxide coming out of power plants, liquefying it. And while this might sound disgusting to many people who are strict environmentalists uh, discharging it into the deep ocean where we were hoping that it would be trapped uh, pretty much forever. Uh, because as all of you know, the oceans are a sink for CO2. What we wanted to do was just accelerate the process a lot more and maybe have it tied up as, as um, CO2 cloth rates, you know, as, as, as ice structures at the bottom of the ocean. Hello. Hello, my name is Diana, I'm from Colombia. Thank you very much for your presentation. i just wondering what, uh, which are the problems uh, regarding to the harvest in your country? Because for example, here in Brazil, we burn the cane, but it's not illegal, mm -hmm. but uh, happen like accidents oh. <laughs> in the field. Um, in South Africa, they have uh, big problems from them because they have a uh, enlarged scale. So they have problems with the mountains. They don't have like um, in industrialized, like uh, make machines for cut. 
and they have problems uh, because they have a manu manual a caffeine and they have like a mamba negra on this kind of mm -hmm. species that you can find. I just wonder which problems do you have with harvinis, maybe with the fauna that you find it. And um, I don't know if you have enough people for cat because it's a hard work. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just a curiosity. Okay, uh, if, if you're talking specifically about something like sugarcane, you know, the, the <coughs> Hawaii has the highest labor rates in the United States. Um, our laborers uh, and people get paid more than anybody else in the United States. So we can't afford to do anything manually. Everything has to be automated. Our harvesting ever since World War II has all been done mechanically. Nobody cut cane uh, you know, by hand as they might in, I, I think in Brazil it's all mechanized too, right? Here, uh, we started with the state of Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. Now we have 100 of our sugar cane mechanically harvested okay. without burning. And the other states like Goiás and Mato Grosso do Sul already mm -hmm. is starting to, uh, to be mandatory, the harvesting uh, with machines. Uh, only in Northeast, we have the manual harvesting and the burning because there we have similar as sa she said, uh, the sugarcane plantations are in small hills, so the slope is too high, uh -huh. and then the machine cannot uh, work yeah. on that. So, uh, but uh, in Northeast, is only 20% of the sugarcane in the country. Yeah. But it's more or less probably the same situation you mentioned in some areas in Colombia. Because of the slope, the machines cannot work, so you have to make it manually. Yeah. Is that yeah. so? Yeah, in Hawaii, the labor rates, again, are, are so high that we can't do anything manually. Uh, there are very few crops or anything that, that we can do by hand. Everything has to be mechanized. Hi, Professor. Yes. Um, André from Brazil. And I want to cast question you about uh, the energy use for the, the biomass that you show it today. Uh, when I say energy use, I say to make elect electricity. See, we do have a lot of um, sites and plants here that use uh, biomass from pinus or from eucalyptus. And I want to know if uh, the, the use of the ener for energy may be uh, increased or maybe uh, become more um, sophisticated by using, for, for instance, microalgaes. If we do achieve a better efficiency, like uh, we are limited by Carnot when we are using this kind of Hunkin cycles or mm -hmm. uh, Brighton cycles. But uh, uh, I, s I know that the US Department of Energy mm -hmm. are trying to use CO2 as a working fluid, so to become more efficient, or using fuel cells that doesn't uh, up the, the cardinal limit doesn't uh, doesn't have been up, doesn't apply to the this kind of technology. Uh -huh. So, do you think that okay, maybe if we reach a uh, higher efficiency to convert uh, this kind of chemical energy in, in electricity, it could be you know, I, instead I have a forest, mm -hmm. I could have a building with a lot of microalgaes, uh, and, and then to, and then remove, for instance, the cost of transportation of the biomass to the power plant. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it, it could be possible? Okay, um, I don't know all of the questions that you asked, but certainly in, in terms of um, <coughs> improving our efficiency, I'm only gonna talk about those that are related to bioenergy. Okay. Um, you're right. Uh, I think I showed a slide there in which we uh, have looked in the past at uh, producing hydrogen from biomass and then using that in a fuel cell, as uh, you probably know. Um, you know. Whereas all of the cycles that I talked about, the Rankine and the Brayton cycle, the steam turbine and the gas turbine cycles, uh, they're all restricted or capped by the second law of thermodynamics. If you go into a fuel cell, it isn't restricted the same way. So whereas the maximum efficiency I could ever get in any kind of uh, heat engine like you saw there would be the Carnot efficiency. Uh, with a fuel cell, I'm not restricted by that. I, I, could, I could actually get my, much higher efficiencies than that. 
So we have looked at uh, fuel cell technologies, but uh, you know, but but uh, all of those things are, are very costly. Um, the technologies that we have in place right now, the boiler steam generator slash gas turbine system, I mean steam turbine system, is uh, you know it's 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 a hundred years old, and uh, it works very very well. Uh, some of these others um, have the potential of much higher efficiency, just as you know. Dr. Coelho talked about the possibility of doing second generation biofuels. Uh, just you know, making that bridge uh, to get there is, is, um, is very difficult. So we haven't been able to make much improvements in, in using better strategies that might be more promising uh, beyond those technologies that we have right now. I, I don't, 